welcome to Conversations With. I'm H. Lee Tony, your host and the Executive Director of the Miami-Dade College Carrie P. Meek Entrepreneurial Education Center. I'm delighted to have with me as my guest, David Wilson, who is a longtime entrepreneur here in Miami and president of DLW Enterprises, a financial and real estate development company. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Why don't you tell us a little bit about DLW Enterprise, how long you've been in business, and how did you come to be in this industry? Well, I got my degree in finance, so I always wanted to be in the finance arena. Um, and I've been in business, I think I opened my first company in 1992, uh, which was a real estate brokerage company focusing on commercial real estate. Uh, in the meantime, I'd always had all my securities license and was managing money for clients and doing a lot of estate planning work and uh, so it sort of sort of uh, married the two businesses together where you would have a client that you sold them their investments as well as their luxury home and mm -hmm. their office buildings and uh, as a result of that um, I ultimately end up in the development business because you have clients that are now looking to uh, build properties or build out properties and so we started doing development then we started doing commercial financing because there were clients who were looking to finance deals but uh, they couldn't find the money. And if they don't close the deal, I don't get paid, so I had to go out and find <laughs> the money. And uh, so we started a financial planning business. Uh, and the last company is a, an investment banking broker dealer, which is approved by FINRA SEC, where we manage clients' funds under that company. So you've been in this industry for how many years? Since 1983, actually. Um, I started out uh, with the bank, Southeast Bank, doing institutional investments in 1983. And when I look at the future for Miami-Dade County and I think about where the, I read about where the county wants to go, one community, one goal plan, banking and finance is still an industry where the county wants to hang its hat. And you mentioned Southeast Bank. Miami used to have a lot of banks that were headquartered here, Southeast Bank, Barnett Bank, had Sun huge Trust, presence. Yeah. Now the banking industry looks a lot different. What do you see as someone who's doing business in this industry? What is your outlook on the financial industry in Miami-Dade County? Well, I think the biggest challenge um, is when you don't have local domiciled banks that are large, a lot of decisions are not made here. Uh, we do have a number of, quote, community banks that are smaller banks that are here uh, that are filling the void, and which is actually quite good. And I think anybody who's going into business should develop relationships with some of the uh, local uh, community banks and smaller banks because the decisions made here and oftentimes, you know, I was doing a deal with a bank and the guy was like, I know the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. I know the area, so that makes your life easier. But one of the bigger voids here is that we still need access to more venture capital money, more private equity money. And it's beginning to come here from the South and uh, Latin America as well as from the Northeast. But um, we need more risk capital. Okay. And what do you see as a, you yourself were a finance major? Um, coming out of school today, if you were, since we are a college and we're talking to our student mm -hmm. audience in part, uh, what advice would you have for a student who's graduating in the next three to five years or who's just starting college and weighing their options about what direction they should take? Uh, what advice would you give or what advice are you giving? Because I know you do a lot of mentoring. Yeah. I think um, I'm encouraging a lot of the young kids to look at entrepreneurship. Um, primarily because when I came out of school, like you mentioned, all the banks, but then we also had a huge airline industry with, with backup support there. And um, so it was easy, particularly a finance major, you could get a degree in finance or economics or business and join a bank. And um, if you weren't, you know, in the front end, there were all these large back end operations. The same with the airline industry, there was these large back end operations that, you know, no longer exist now. And um, in lies a challenge because literally, I think in South Florida, or certainly in Dade County, we may have two Fortune 500 companies. So the, the, the ability to go out and just readily get a job, um, and certainly with a large company, is challenging. And our largest employees are typically nonprofits, the University of Miami, the government, the hospital. Um, so um, I'm encouraging a lot of young people to strike out in the entrepreneur space. Well, there's a lot of support for that in the ecosystem that's mm -hmm. growing here in Miami-Dade County. Um, 
most people and a lot of our residents, some of whom come from families that are highly entrepreneurial, some not at all. What mm. do you think um, are the critical success factors for someone looking at uh, starting a company? Yeah. Well, I think um, you have to get some experience in. I remember going to a, a seminar many, many years ago, mm -hmm. a fellow by the name of Mark McCormick who started um, uh, one of the huge marketing companies, um, I can't call the name of it now, but one of his thing was, and he wrote the book, What They Don't Teach You in the Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. And the whole process, IMG was the company that he founded, uh, which now represents all the major athletes, including Venus and Serena Williams. But he said, if you want your primary job or you want to get experience, go and work for free. And the whole idea was that if you add value, obviously somebody will stop paying you, but you got to get experience. Um, and um, you can get experience by volunteering in areas and in industry that you like, you know, um, where you develop relationships as well as you develop experience that necessarily you would not get. Like if we were talking off, off camera about the film industry. Well, if you volunteer to work in, you know, for a company that's doing film or, you know, you're doing it at your college or your university, uh, you can get those kinds of experience that you necessarily can't get because the industry is still emerging here. So where are you from, David? Miami. Well, you're I was born native. in South Carolina, but my family moved here when I was six. Oh, so you're practical. You're, you're native for Absolutely. all intents and I'm purposes. I'm fluent in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> that and, we should, you native. And, and has that made doing business for you? Oh, tremendous. What impact has that had, oh, had for great. you being bilingual yeah. and having that facility? Oh, let me tell you, it, it, it's great. I think, I think everybody in Miami should be bilingual, and I think everybody in this country actually should be bilingual and speak several languages, because uh, in other countries they do. But I've done real estate transactions solely in Spanish. Um, I've done transactions where, you know, everybody speaks English, but they decide they want to speak Spanish sometime when they can speak English and don't know that I speak Spanish. <laughs> um, but also, it, it allows you to connect with people at a deeper level. Uh, and, you know, we often think about the Spanish market here, um, which is vast. I've done transactions with folk from Colombia and Venezuela and, you know, a host of Latin countries uh, in addition to, you know, folk from Cuba of Cuban descent. And um, it, it, it just, you know, it opens up a larger opportunity for you. We're going to talk about that when we come back from our first break. Relationship building and how to be successful um, developing relationships in a multicultural community like Miami. So stay with us. We'll be back in a few moments. Good. Thank you. Cool programs for hot jobs. Let Miami-Dade College jumpstart your career. We offer bachelor's degrees in film and TV production, electronics engineering, supervision and management, and nursing. Or choose from 300 other programs. With our flexible course schedules, you can take classes during the day, evening, weekend, or online. For more info, visit mdc.edu or call 305-237-8888. Get the knowledge and training for today's in-demand jobs. Register now. David, so good to have you here with Conversations With, and thank you for tuning in as well. David, I want to talk to you about um, something we, were, we left off before yeah. the break, the importance of relationships. You and I have known each yeah. other since uh, we were undergrads yep. here in Miami. Talk to me about the importance of developing relationships when you're in business and how especially important that is uh, when you are going to need access to capital. Yeah. Well, you know, it's... Um you know, we live in a great community. Uh, Miami is probably, and I, I get to travel a fairly decent amount, and one of the things is that we do, across culture, almost a force to interact with each other. Um, you don't have nearly as many silos um, as you find in some of the other cities where there's purely a, a this community, that community, this community. I mean, where my parents live, our neighbors have been Hispanic for the last almost 25, 30 years. And, uh, 
and, and in fact, they don't speak English. My, my, my parents don't speak uh, <laughs> Spanish, and they get along just perfectly, you know. <laughs> and, um, I mean, we go to all the pork we roasts. We find a the, way to communicate. Absolutely. That's the right. Quincy parties and the pork <laughs> roasts, and now we're all older as, uh, you know, uh, if we're, as kids when we grew up together, and, you know, we look at each other's kids now. And, but I think, you know, those kinds of relationships and extended relationships in this community is very, very important. Um, uh, for instance, I've always stayed involved with my alma mater, the University of Miami, because uh, those are relationships and those are institutional relationships that are important. Um, and when you know, I was sitting on a board at the University of Miami when I did my first development project, and there was a guy sitting next to me whose friend had just opened a bank. I'd never done a development project in my life, <laughs> but uh, he says, "Hey, I got to introduce you to my friend." Next thing you know, they're financing my deal. Um, and 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 my my you know my my baby and what I really love is I served for 15 years as the treasurer for the Arch Center, and as a I was result, bring that up. Yeah, yeah. and as a result, the people and the relationships that I developed there uh, are lifelong. You know, I mean, I know their families; they know my family, um, because people do business with people; they don't do business with deals. And if they know you and they're comfortable with you, they're willing to do business with you and, and take a risk. Or at least if you go to the bank and there are tons of people involved with the center that were either senior people at banks and some that own banks, and at least if you go to that bank and they say no, they have the ability to say no, you know, mm -hmm. versus you go walk in and you're sitting at the front desk downstairs, you know. Um, and so I think that those relationships, relationship is the key actually, relationship then you got to have at least some money. I always say you got to have money to pay your way into the dance. <laughs> Folk don't care that you dance, at least pay your way in. And then you got to have some skills. I mean, you don't even have to be the brightest and the smartest. I mean, when you look at uh, whether it's the guys who started these tech companies, a lot of them didn't really create the initial product, you know. Um, but they had enough of knowledge to recognize that it was there. But they, you know, I don't think Bill Gates is going to sit down and write code or never did write code. In fact, he bought his first uh, piece of software, which was the disk operation system. But again, it's about those relationships that lead to the next uh, next phase. So as we were saying, you want to you don't want to look for friends when you need them. You want to have friends before you before need them. Before you need them. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned two good examples of your civic and your philanthropic work. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of times it's mm -hmm. difficult for a small business owner to think that that matters when they're doing business. But really, it, it is very yeah. vitally important. And the thing that Miami, unfortunately, is noted for, especially among our younger folks, is for the lack of civic engagement. What, yeah. do you, what can you yeah. tell us about how that has benefited you over time, yeah. your civic work, your philanthropic yeah. work? Well, you know, because I grew up here, and, and I, you know, I really love this city. I, I believe in this city. I believe in all the diverse cultures of this city. You know, I've, you know, just as equally relationships that I have in the Hispanic community, I have in the Jewish community, um, because, you know, this is our home, and, and we should try to make a difference. And so if you believe in it, then you get involved in it. And I think to some degree, you have um, a lot of transplants, people who transplanted here, so maybe they just don't feel some of the same things. But, you know, being in the real estate business, um, you know, I can tell you what Little Havana looked like in, you know, 1970. I went to school on South Beach in the late 60s, early 70s. So Before it was South before, Beach, right? Yeah, before it was <laughs> South Beach. Yeah. yeah, in fact, some of the first nightclubs that opened on South Beach, uh, when Luther Campbell did his club, you know, I was instrumental in helping him do that lease in 1992. Uh, but we were comfortable because we were here. And in fact, he went to school on the beach as well. And so I think that drives to some degree one's civic involvement. But I think the other thing is you're going to live in a community and you want to be a part of that community, then you got to participate. I want to, I want to, we may not be able to finish this before mm -hmm. the break, but I want to bring it up because you mentioned uh, something that I think is really important. You helped mm -hmm. Luther Campbell with his lease. Mm -hmm. The thing that we see sometimes with small businesses or people who have amazing passion, great ideas, very talented, but it's the operational things that turn out to be the Achilles heel, yeah. right? Is that the best lease that I signed? Have yeah. I 
hitch my wagon to the right investment partner. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we find out about the difficulties late. after late. Yeah. Too late to really make well, a difference. One of the How books, can we get at that? One of the books I got in me that I haven't written yet uh, <laughs> is uh, Tradesmen versus Entrepreneur. And mm. what you just described is people who are tradesmen. And they can be good at what they do, but that's not going to make you money. You know, you got to be an entrepreneur. And as an entrepreneur, there's a whole plethora of things you got to understand. And today, for instance, technology, you know, um, you know, you got to be able to do more and just turn it off and, and, and cut it back on if there's a problem. Um, you got to understand enough about marketing. You got to, you know, you got to understand financials. Financial modeling, I tell people financial statements is like a crystal ball. It'll tell you what's going to happen in the future if you keep doing the same things, you know, because the numbers are not going to change. And if you do some different things, it can tell you what that future is going to look like. And unfortunately, a lot of small entrepreneurs, they, they, they like what they do, mm. but they never stop and say, let me do some financial modeling. Let me see if I sign on this lease, wow. am I going to make enough of money to be able to then pay people, pay all the expenses, and pay the lease? Because ultimately, the only person who's making money is the landowner, you know, the landlord, because you got to pay him whether you're making a profit or not. And in fact, I told people, I said, you need to make the landlord your partner and simply say, I'll show you all my financials, but I'm not going to pay you if I'm not making any money. And it's a, it may be a, a, a black swan out of the norm, but you got to try it if you want to be successful. And, and in most instances, the, the landlord want to see you successful because he's going to get paid just like the banks want to see you successful. They're not in the real estate business. They don't want to take your property back, but they will. They will. And I want to talk about that when we come back from the break, because you and I have talked about this before, where we observe in entrepreneurs uh, th uh, the, the need to be bolder, to yeah. propose something out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. and just to negotiate. Absolutely. And we want to talk about negotiation when we come back, because that is something that's vitally needed, the yeah. understanding yeah. that negotiation is expected in the mm -hmm. business environment. Absolutely. So please stay with us in Conversations With. Uh, we'll be right back after this break. Fresh thinking is being served at Miami-Dade College. Create your own recipe for success in the evolution of food culture at the Miami Culinary Institute. Learn the skills you need to jumpstart your career in the culinary arts. Turn green into gourmet and celery into salary. Miami Culinary Institute. Food. Culture. Innovation. Visit us at MiamiDadeCulinary.com. Register now. Miami Culinary Institute. Welcome back to Conversations With. I'm H. Lee Tony, your host, and my guest today is David Wilson. Uh, before we break, we started talking about negotiation, and I know in your industry you are the master. You must be the master of negotiation. So what is a typical day like? Uh, what, to what do you attribute your success? And maybe you could share with our viewers um, a failure or two that has impacted your career. I'll tell you, you fail, I mean, you, you fail quite a bit, you know, um, but failure is not, you know, permanent. Um, a typical day for me, I typically uh, 12 hours, you know, I get into the office around 8 and I'm usually, you know, out around 8 um, and sometimes longer and uh, I typically work on Saturdays, you know, whether it's a half a day, um, but that's what you do and, and particularly the last five years hadn't been kind to any of us. In fact, <laughs> my whole industry actually hadn't been kind since 1999 uh, in the investment side. We had the tech bubble burst in 1999, which if you look at the Dow Jones, it's been flat, you know, virtually for the last 14 years. If you look at NASDAQ, it has not recovered from where it was at its peak in 1999. And so a lot of people were not investing. And then, you know, a lot of the money ran into the real estate business, which ultimately created these exotic products and by 2006, that market took a hit, and uh, you know we were caught in the midst of a development project that uh, really went south real quick. Um, 
you know, because we understand negotiations, we were able to negotiate with our banks. And the banks were, you know, if you were talking to the bank and communicating with the banks, they were willing to talk with you. So we were able to restructure some debt and things of that nature uh, to, to survive. But um, it had been a, a very difficult time for most people in business, and particularly with, with small businesses, because uh, there weren't no bailout. If you look mm -hmm. at the definition in America of a small business, I think it's under 300 employees. Yeah, 500 employees. Yeah, 500 employees. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is most people in America are employed by companies with 10 employees or less. Or fewer, yes, yeah. exactly. But all of the resources typically go to these larger uh, entities, which you know most people, if they had 300 employees, would be ready to retire right now. But um, you know, now we we've had you know quite a bit of challenges. I think one of the best things that we've done over the last 10, 15 years is we invested quite a bit in technology, so that like most corporate America now, uh, you don't need a lot of manpower, you know, because you can do it with technology. Cloud. So yeah. is your business doing work in the cloud? Well, we we run our own service, uh, okay. and some of the software that we use. Uh, when we looked at the cloud, they had not had the uh, flexibility that we wanted just yet. And, um, but we revisited probably every year. And ultimately, we probably will go to the cloud. Um, um, it's helpful to, you know, when you want to access anyway. But you still got to have your, with the cloud, you still got to have your base software somewhere because cloud just stores the data. So Miami is sort of a startup city now. All mm -hmm. of this, there's all this new energy, new resources, new support for startup companies. So as a veteran entrepreneur, what would you say are the top three things that you would invite, uh, advise someone who's considering becoming an entrepreneur to do? Yeah. Well, I think you got to look at where the opportunities are. If I was looking at, first of all, I would look to maybe buy a business, and people would be surprised how inexpensive it is to buy a business hmm. and the fact of the matter is that there's capital out there whether it's SBA or banks or whatever uh, whether it's owner financing um, um, and you're already buying a book of operation uh, when I'm looking at industry I like everything in, in um, environmental you know anything that the recycling um, that's the you know that's the buzzword hmm. um, that's the opportunity green, green exactly. absolutely if you can do anything in that space and then there's still always your your standard brick and mortar types of businesses um, people going to eat those kinds of consumer cyclical types of businesses that are going to always be there because there are other businesses that are definitely going to go out of business because the industry just don't you know they're just not going to be competitive if you look at america as an example we manufacture more in this country now than we've ever manufactured in our lifetime. But the reality of it is much more automated. So you go on a factory floor in Detroit and where there were a thousand people, there may be 90 engineers. You know? That's right, that's right. You, you do a lot of business in downtown and in Wynwood and all of the kind of hot areas. What can you talk to us about how we can translate some of that energy, some of that vibrancy into the economic corridors of, of the suburbs or the inner city yes. neighborhoods? Well, I think, I think the inner city neighborhoods now are very prime for growth uh, because of all that development that's coming in to those areas. If you look at the tr South Beach, for instance, the South Beach led to the uh, entertainment district, which led to Wynwood because it got too expensive on South Beach, so then they moved to the That's entertainment right. district. Then that got so expensive, they moved to Wynwood, and you know, in, com in conjunction with what's going on in the design district. So where is the next space where you're going to be able to find a more avant-garde type of opportunity? I was, uh, I went to an, uh, an event or, or some club out in uh, in Red Road, it was called the Red Road Cultural Arts District, which I did not know exist. I have heard of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was a it, and it was in this warehouse area, and it was these young folk that were doing poetry, uh, reading, rap, and playing instruments, and it was a very diverse crowd, which was reflective of of, of uh, Miami Dade County Hispanics and whites and Haitian and African American and Jamaicans. And uh, it, was, it was like the coolest thing, you know. Mm. And so and I'm on looking, Red Road, you know, Red Road, uh, up in up in a warehouse I district, have off, that. Of, yeah. off of the Palmetto. In fact, I had a call two or three times to, <laughs> to, to say, "Are you sure it's in here?" You know. But you know, I can see that happening in in some of the inner city quarters. Uh, I remember what Harlem was like in 1920, uh, 1985, when I would go. Uh, 
go to uh, New York and hang out in Harlem. I remember where Brooklyn was and Flatbush when nobody wanted to hang out there, a DuPont Circle in D.C., Georgia Avenue in D.C., you know, and I've always looked at Miami is being 15, 20 years behind some of those major cities and we're catching up rapidly and I think we're going to see the emergence of some of these inner city cores and some of these major thoroughfares, northwest thoroughfares and some of the east-west thoroughfares in, in Miami. We'll talk more about that when we invite you back to conversations with next time, David. Thank you so much My uh, for being our guest today on Conversations With. Uh, we always hope to, uh, and I enjoy your mm. talking with you because mm. I think you give people a lot to think about. Is this mix of the futuristic and what's ahead, but also some very practical tips for what you can do to um, get engaged with the entrepreneurial community right now in Miami-Dade County. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Hope you enjoyed today's show and our guest, David Wilson. We certainly enjoyed talking with you and we invite you to tune in for our next episode of Conversations With.